Hello and welcome to everyone on the line today. Uh, this is the MOASC Annual Professional Educational Series for Oncology Administrators. My name is Nicole East. I'm the Executive Director of MOASC. Today we have a fantastic lineup of speakers to discuss how you can help your human resource team perform at their peak. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to type them in the chat box or go ahead and unmute your line. I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker today, Tom Erb. He is the president of Talon Resources. Tom will discuss the current and future state of the labor market, what it means for businesses and the economy, and how you can gain a significant advantage by changing the way you approach the recruiting process. With a career spanning over 25 years, Tom has established himself as one of the top subject matters or matter experts in the talent acquisition profession. So without further delay, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Tom. All right, thanks, Nicole. Hi, everybody. Um, so uh, and, and let me start off with, uh, I will get this presentation in Nicole, so I, I would assume anybody could have access to it, um, uh, just because there's lots of good stuff in here that you may want to share with others and also just kind of have handy. So uh, we're going to talk about the, you know, the elephant in the room here uh, as far as just the challenges that everybody is having with attracting and retaining talent. And uh, if misery loves company, then you know, you're in good company because everybody's struggling with it. And what we found is that in talking with employers, uh, in talking even with like staffing and recruiting companies, which I do quite a bit, is that people um, don't quite have a full understanding of what's going on or they're not paying attention maybe to some of the more macroeconomic issues that we're facing. And so I'm going to talk about those. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that uh, this information is, you know, it, it is meant to really kind of enlighten you and, and to change perhaps the approach that you take uh, to hiring your own uh, talent. And so uh, let's go ahead and jump in. So one of the things that we've um, hear over and over again is this term of being ghosted, right? We all have heard the term of being ghosted. You probably have used it uh, before. And the term of ghosting just means that uh, a person all of a sudden is not talking to me anymore, and I don't know why. And so what I see when I'm talking to companies, when I'm talking to employers, um, over and over again, I hear the same thing. So why people think they're being ghosted. And I still am hearing mutterings about that they're in enhanced unemployment benefits and other types of benefits that came out of COVID um, that they are still creating incentives to stay home. I just got an email from one of my clients about an hour ago where he mentioned this. And um, this is assuming that people took that money and squirreled it away and are slowly using it up. And that's really usually not the, the instance. Uh, most of those unemployment benefits or other types of benefits have long been spent. The pandemic has created barriers to work and that is certainly true. We still have a large number of, of people that uh, have things such as long COVID and also have different reasons why they haven't entered back in the workforce. But even if every single one of those came back in the workforce, we would still have millions and millions of open jobs. And so while that does have um, an impact on the employment situation, it certainly is not the driving factor behind this. Uh, we hear a lot about people being more remote, doing remote interviewing, having more communication remotely, that that reduces the commitment and people don't show up to interviews and people don't show up on the first day of work. There may be some of that, but it's, it's more, I think, anecdotal than anything. And then lastly, we hear about candidates being unmotivated, unreliable, disrespectful. Nobody wants to work. We hear that over and over again. You even see restaurants that are putting up signs that say, we're closed today because nobody wants to work. Well, I've been in the staffing and recruiting industry for almost 30 years. 30 years ago, we were saying nobody wanted to work. So that's not uh, really much of a change either. There are, however, a lot of reasons why they are ghosting us. And I'm gonna break it down into three different areas. The first one is quite frankly, there just aren't enough people to go around. Uh, we're gonna show you some data on this. Um, you may have seen some of this data, you probably have heard some of it, but when we put it all together, you'll really see why we have this perfect storm of, of talent shortage 
uh, why that is, what's driving that, and kind of what it's going to be like here in the future. The second reason is they don't like us. They And it's not that they dislike us. It's that we oftentimes don't give candidates a reason to really like us. We don't engage them. We don't recruit them like we're supposed to. Uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit. And then in most cases, we tend to be too slow. Things go very, very fast. There's a ton of competition out there. And when somebody applies to our job, we need to move at lightning speed and uh, we need to figure out how to do that. So we're going to talk about those three different areas. That's what we're going to talk about as far as attracting talent. And then we're going to talk about how do we retain talent once we have them. I want to start off with this whole concept of fair share. Uh, I hear variations of this. I hear that, you know, I just want my fair share. Or we'll hear even more uh, often, yeah, I put a job posting out on Indeed and I didn't get any candidates, as if we should all get our fair share. I just want to get my fair share. I want to have candidates that apply. I want to be able to pick a good one and I want them to start. There is no fair share anymore. And I'm going to show you some data that shows why that is. And if we think that we're just going to get a slice of the pie, we're going to approach recruiting in the wrong way. And that's what most people are doing. And like I said, I work a lot with recruiting firms and staffing firms who it is their very existence to understand the labor market. And even they, in most cases, approach it as if I just need to get my fair share. Um, so let's talk about kind of where we're at, but let's start with before the pandemic. The pandemic gets a lot of blame, credit, whatever you want to call it, for the situation that we're in right now. But in reality, prior to the pandemic, we still had major issues. This was already happening. On the left-hand side, you can see at uh, prior to the pandemic, February of 2020, we had 1.4 million more jobs than job seekers. We had over 7 million open jobs, which at that time was a record by far. And we had 19 states at historic low unemployment. If we look at this pie chart here, this is how the talent pool was divided up at that time. And we had about 4% unemployment. We had about 9% um, that are considered active job seekers, which means they're employed, but they're actively looking for a job. So they're applying regularly to jobs. They got the resume out on job boards. They don't even care if their employer sees it anymore. So about 9% is considered active. And then we have this area that people aren't as familiar with, but it's a very important group, which are the semi-active. Semi-active mean that they are thinking about making a change, but they haven't fully committed to it. We call these the window shoppers, the tire kickers. These are the ones that are going out onto a job board. They're looking at 50 different job postings and maybe they're applying to one if it really catches their attention. They're talking to their friends and family saying, they're, you know, I'm thinking about starting to make a move. I'm starting to get more serious about this, but they haven't fully committed yet. 37% of those traditional passive job seekers that you always hear about. These are the ones that are happy in their job. They probably don't have an updated resume. But if somebody was to present them with an interesting opportunity, they would listen. And so that's a really important group as well. And then the last group is the not moving. And about 25% studies show about 25% uh, of the workforce at any given time is not moving, either because maybe they own the company, maybe they're a partner at the company, maybe they're, they're invested. They have they have different reasons. They may be brand new and in the honeymoon phase. They may just love where they work um, or they may be averse to moving. But for whatever reason, that group at any given time uh, is not moving. That's what it was like in February of 2020 before COVID hit. Let's fast forward to today. It doesn't look a whole lot different, but it's actually worse. <laughs> Uh, in respect to we have even more of a shortage. So now we're down to three, about three and a half percent actually unemployment, about 12 percent are active job seekers, and all the rest is pretty much the same. It's shifted around a little bit, but not very much. We were already heading towards this, this trend. It wasn't pandemic that, that uh, caused it. If anything, it just kind of covered it up. It just kind of, of uh, it certainly accelerated it in certain situations, and we'll talk about that. Uh, U.S. unemployment, I mentioned, is at 3.5% right now. 5.8 million unemployed people that are in the U.S., 10.75 million employers. So there is basically one or two employers for every unemployed person. 
So when we talk about getting our fair share, you can see we're certainly not getting our fair share of people that are unemployed. And even if we add in active job seekers, we're barely getting uh, even one job seeker per employer. This is also a really important, um, important graph here. This is the Federal Reserve um, uh, employment graph. And what this is showing is total job openings in the US. And you may have seen the statistics lately, the, the news that if you look over here, uh, open jobs actually dropped dramatically in the past month. And it went from a high of almost 12 million down to we're down about 10 million. It's not because we have more people. It's because what we're seeing over and over again is that employers are stopping posting jobs. They're stopping looking for it. We're seeing more and more, and I'm sure you see it all the time, restaurants that have just closed down either partly, they've, they've shortened their hours or they've closed down completely because they can't find people. What we're basically seeing is of that 10 million, it is mostly that employers are giving up trying to fill these jobs. Not that all of a sudden we have an influx of candidates. But you take a look at this. If we look over here to the left here, this is the end of the Great Recession in 2009. We were at about two and a half million open jobs. We have been going up steadily ever since then. And of course, we hit the pandemic where we troughed in, in April of 20, 2020, but it jumped right back up and is accelerated. Don't expect this to keep going down. It's going to level out. It's going to go back up. Now, there are economic factors that could cause it to continue to bounce around at that number, may go down a little bit more. Uh, but for the most part, we're going to see that that's going to stay up. Here's the reason why. There is a term that you may be familiar with called the replacement rate. <clears throat> what the replacement rate is, is um, how many children do people need to have to replace themselves? And economists pretty much universally agree that the number is 2.1. And you see that this is the, the black line that goes across here, 2.1. So if we look at when the baby boomers were born, this is why it was called the baby boom, is because we were up above three and a half almost to four uh, which was double the replacement rate. That's why we saw the big boom. The problem is, is that for the next 50 years, we saw a bust. And so Gen X, when they were born, we saw that drop well below replacement rate. It has gotten back up a little bit close to replacement rate for Gen Y and Gen Z. And now we are seeing a significant downward trend that is continuing that is putting us well below the replacement rate. And all indications are this will continue to drop. Not only uh, are people having less children, but they're spacing it out a lot farther. They're not having children as frequently in their early 20s, mid 20s. Now it's getting longer and longer into the 30s, mid 30s, even late 30s. And so we're also spreading out these generations more. So for 50 years, we have not had enough people to replace the baby boomers that are now retiring. That's not it. There's more that goes with it. and. Um, uh, it's, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, this is really the perfect storm of things that are going on. This is why you're having so many challenges. And so I mentioned if misery loves company, well, then you've got it here because this is impacting everybody, not just in the US, but this is actually a global issue. Um, there are other factors that go into this. Baby boomers are not only retiring, but they are retiring at a faster and faster clip. Prior to the pandemic, Baby boomers re were retiring at about 2 million a year. In 2020, 3 million retired. 2021, 3 and a half million retired. That's actually the opposite of what we thought would happen. We thought the baby boomers had not, had not saved up enough to be able to effectively retire or at least fully retire and that they would actually work later than our average retirement age. They also tend to be healthier now. And so people would stay into their late 60s, even 70s. And we do see that some. But what we're actually seeing is baby boomers retiring in many cases early, or at least semi-retiring. We're even seeing the oldest parts of Gen X starting to retire and semi-retire. And so that's causing kind of a double whammy because we thought we would have them longer. The birth rate continues below the replacement level. We already talked about that. So we've got competing things there. Newer generations are actually working less. In fact, 
there are studies that show that males of Gen, uh, Gen Z and millennials are working on average 14% less than previous generations, and that is by choice. We're also seeing employees leave the workforce for all sorts of reasons. Uh, entrepreneurship, it's easier than ever to start your own business. Gig work, you're doing Uber and DoorDash and all these different types of gigs, consulting work, that kind of stuff, that they're still working, but it's taking them out of the traditional workforce. Part-time work, we're seeing major trends in this, and I'm gonna talk about this later because I think this is a real opportunity for us. More and more, particularly younger generations, don't wanna work a full-time job. They would rather work a couple of part-time jobs or a part-time job, some gig work, and maybe an a entrepreneurial job. Uh, they're doing all sorts of different ways. The way that they are looking at work and the way that they're looking at employment and being able to, to cover their bills is becoming much different than how we have traditionally looked at. And then lastly, there's an increasing population that's not working at all, or at least they're not working enough to show up. And uh, you know, we call that the participation rate. The partic participation rate in the U.S., for decades has been somewhere around 66 to 68%. That has dropped down to 62%, and now it continues to decrease. That may not sound like a much, but it's actually tens of millions of people, or at least millions of people that we're talking about. So we've got all of these different things that are causing this shortage. The reason why I bring this up is not to depress you. Uh, it's, uh, it's really to say, oh, this is why this is happening. I need to approach this differently. And if we can approach this differently, then you're gonna have a competitive advantage on your talent competition. All of those others that are in your market that are trying to get the same people as you, they think this is gonna get better. I still talk to people on a regular basis that go, well, you know, when the, when the market softens up, well, when people come back to work, they're not coming back to work. There's, there's nowhere for them to come to. If anything, it's going to continue to get worse as baby boomers continue to retire and we have less and less people uh, from younger generations that are replacing them. So this is an opportunity for us, but we have to change the way that we approach things. So what do we need to do? Well, at a high level, we need to consistently be more attractive to our candidates. We need to be more aggressive than our talent competitors. I don't mean in a bad way, but we need to be more, we, we need to, to go after, we need to take more than our fair share. We need to be more purposeful. We need to have a strategy around it. Strategy is not putting a job on Indeed and hoping for the best. We call that post and pray, and that's not a strategy. Um, and we need to be more committed to retaining our employees because the worst thing we can do is go and get people and then lose them out the back door. So let's talk about all that. Let's talk about first about they don't like us. Um, and it's not that they dislike you. I'm not trying to offend anybody. Um, but we don't give them an opportunity to truly like us. We're not creating demand in most cases, uh, or we're not consistently creating demand, or we're not creating it early enough. And I was talking to one of my clients that they have a huge call center in a fairly rural market. They have about 18,000 people in the town that they're in, and they need 800 call center employees. And what we were talking about was the challenges that they were having. And they said, we're, we are very engaging once they get here. The problem is we can't get them here. And I said, well, you need to be engaging before the time that they come in for an open house or come in for an interview, or whatever. We need to be engaging from the very beginning. So some questions to ask yourself is, am I recruiting or am I just processing candidates? What is my approach from the very, very beginning, from the first conversation that I have with them every single conversation that I have uh, along the way. Is my job posting appealing? Have I even thought about what my job posting says or do I just copy and paste my, my job description? How do they feel after our initial call? Uh, do they feel anything at all? One thing to ask yourself is after every single call with that candidate, when they're inevitably asked by their spouse or significant other or friends or kids or parents or whoever it is, when they go, what was that all about? What did they say? Oh, it's just another company. I, I applied to a bunch of jobs. I don't even remember applying to them. I applied to a bunch of jobs on Indeed. And uh, they said that I applied to their job. I'll see if I go. We'll see what else comes up. 
Or do they say, wow, that was a really great opportunity. That was a great call. I think I really would like working there. I can't wait to get to my interview to see what it's going to be like. So we have to think about these things. We talk about being more purposeful. Why would they want to work with us instead of another company? If we have people that are applying to jobs, which by the way, if they're applying on Indeed or Monster or any other kind of job board, uh, they're not just applying to your job. They're applying to 20, 30, 40, 50 other jobs, depending on if they're unemployed or active. Um, if they're semi-active, they're only going to apply to the job if it really catches their attention and it is something that is compelling to them. The active and unemployed job seekers, they'll apply to everything. And they're encouraged by these job boards to apply to everything because the job boards want to go back and say, hey, look how many applicants that you have. And so we have to think about how do we line up compared to all the others that are trying to recruit them as well? How do we keep them feeling engaged and valued throughout the whole process? It can't, it can't just start with the job posting or with the initial phone screen. It has to be thought through the entire way through. Is there any point in the process where they don't feel engaged and valued? Because that's our best chance of losing them. So the strategy is simple. Just be likable. Um, and I know it sounds easy. It's amazing how often I sit in uh, on interviews. I sit in on phone screens, those types of things. And we're just not likable. We're not trying to be likable. We're pleasant. We're professional, but are we likable? Are we engaging? So how do we greet applicants with enthusiasm, respect, and value? My recommendation is, is that you actually create a script. You have friendly people that are the first ones to reach out to them. They're engaging. They're, they're talking about, thank you so much for applying. We're so excited to talk to you about this. Not just, thank you for applying. You know, here, fill out this application. We need to engage them. Treat every single applicant as if they're your next great employee. Sometimes we get a little bit jaded because we're going through all these applicants and they're not the right fit. They're not as strong as we want them to be. They don't seem really committed to it. They don't have a great work history. And so over the course of time, that sometimes shows in how enthusiastically that we interact with them. We need to think about it. This could be the next great employee every time. If we have to force ourselves to say that to ourselves. Um, and make every single interaction positive and memorable so that we don't lose them or we're less likely to lose them throughout the process. I want to give you a, an example here. So let's uh, for a second say that we've got a new restaurant that's in the market and they are posting an advertisement. They're trying to get people to come to their restaurant. Tell me if you would eat here. ABC Cafe is looking for customers that will spend their money to eat food at our restaurant, exclamation point. So trying to add excitement at the end by adding an exclamation point. Um, okay, not too exciting yet. At ABC Cafe, you will read a menu and select items for consuming, eat your meal within a reasonable amount of time, review and pay the bill. Does that sound like a great restaurant yet? Does that sound like somewhere that you would want to go and eat? Probably not. The ideal customer must possess the following, a friendly and positive attitude, appreciation for the opportunity to eat, ability to eat quickly, adequate financial resources. You get the idea. And then the last piece is, customers that meet the above criteria can expect to receive a chair, a table to eat on, menu with items for purchase, a full range of utensils and complimentary water with their meal, exclamation point to make it exciting. Would you eat here? I. I I know we're on a webinar and you're on mute, so you can't answer that. But the answer is no, right? We would not eat here. This is ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. And yet that same restaurant posts a job posting that looks like this. ABC is looking for experienced servers. At ABC Cafe, you will be responsible for serving each guest courteously. Have a sincere, positive, pleasant, and enthusiastic attitude. Answer questions, suggestively sell. The ideal candidate must possess the following. And then we go through all the stuff they have to have. And so if we look back at this as an advertisement for this restaurant, we think it's ridiculous. And yet go and look at your job postings, at your competitor's job postings, at any job posting on Indeed or any other job boards. And odds are, this is what it's gonna read like. We don't take the time to try and actually recruit. We throw it out there and we think we're gonna get our fair share because we're gonna have people that are gonna apply to it. The other thing that we're doing is we're creating job postings like this with the false assumption that a bunch of people may apply that aren't qualified. 
And because of that, I need to screen them out. So I need to have lots of requirements in here so that they don't apply. And so there's, there's a bunch of different mistakes that we make when we're posting jobs and I see it over and over again. The first thing is we tend to post job descriptions, not marketing pieces. We're not trying to recruit people with the job. We think we are, but we're not recruiting people. We're not attracting people with our job posting. We're just putting a list of requirements and what we would like to have. We're acting like candidates don't have other choices, which the total opposite is true. They have tons of choices. The best candidates have lots and lots of choices. We also make everything about what it is that we want and need, not about what they want and what would attract them to the job. We also, like I said, are trying to screen out unqualified candidates. I'm gonna show you why that is uh, something we shouldn't be focused on. We assume job postings are meant for active job seekers. So you remember that pie chart. You've got the three and a half percent unemployed, you got the 12% active. So you got about five, 15, roughly 15% 15 of the workforce that's actively looking for a job. That's not who job postings are meant for. They will apply to your job anyways because they go through and they apply to a job and then Indeed comes back and says, oh, you like that job? Here's 20 other jobs that you might be interested in applying to. Or they go into Monster and they can swipe left on any job. They don't even look at it. We talk to candidates that are unemployed that talk about applying to jobs on job boards four to six hours a day. It's not hard to apply to a job. Think of how many they can apply to in four to six hours. Um, so what we're really trying to do is create job postings that catch the attention of that semi-active job seeker or catch the attention of somebody that knows that passive job seeker because they're not looking for jobs. But then they can say, hey, I ran across a job the other day that I thought you might be interested in. Here it is. And also then, hey, if it can't be exciting, we can always throw more exclamation marks at the end of it, try and make it more exciting. Um, I did a quick search on, I actually did this on LinkedIn jobs. I like LinkedIn jobs because one, it's an aggregator. It pulls in from other job boards. It pulls in from other sources. But the other reason why I like to do it is because it shows how many people have applied to the job. And I took these and I ran a nursing assistant in San Diego and a registered nurse in San Diego. First of all, you got over 500 nursing assistant jobs. You got almost 2,500. Uh, registered nurse jobs in here. But look at the applicants. Two, zero, one, zero, zero, one, four. That's a good one. Zero, seven. Kaiser Permanente has seven. Even seven is not enough, right? Um, we're hoping that we're going to get dozens of options that we can select from. And if you go through, I can go page after page after page and show you that this trend doesn't change. I didn't go through and cherry pick these. These are, this is just a typical page. You're not getting the applicant flow that you need to be. And the reason is, is because one, we're, we're trying to have people self-screen out by listing all the requirements. And two, uh, they have lots and lots of options. Registered nurse has almost 2,500 different positions, and we could have that go even further if we look more at travel nursing and some other options that they have. It comes to the point of we need to have more what we call candidate-centric job postings. And the overwhelming majority of job postings out there are employer-centric. And so the difference is, is that on the employer-centric side, we see phrases like the ideal candidate must possess the following skills. We are looking for candidates that can do this. Are you hardworking and dependable? Uh, have you ever known anybody to admit that they're, they're not hardworking and dependable? They may say that they're unlucky, they're misunderstood, that, you know, that they, they're treated incorrectly, but nobody's going to admit, yeah, you know what, I'm really not that hardworking and dependable. So we put stuff in there that really doesn't even screen anybody out and must be able to pass a drug screen. Candidate-centric. Are you looking for the next stage in your career? Plenty of time for your personal life. Have you always wanted to do this? You are the type of person who enjoys. We're painting a picture. We're trying to get them to psychologically think about what their life would be life like if they worked for your company and in that position. It's the same thing as a realtor taking you to a house and looking over and saying, can you see a fire in the fireplace there? Can you see your family sitting 
in the dining room for Thanksgiving dinner. They're trying to paint this picture. They're trying to create this emotional connection. That's what we need to try and do. And so we need to think about what are the selling points of our organization and of the position. And we need to lead with that. We can go into details later. We, we want to go into details. We want to have specifics, but we don't have to have that up at the very top, which is usually what happens. Let's sell them first, get them pulled in, then they can see if they're qualified for the position. So let me ask you, which job would you apply for? This is, these are two that I actually pulled off, um, pulled off of uh, Indeed, I think. And uh, this is the first one. Company A is seeking to hire an outpatient case manager for a physician's managed care service organization in San Diego. Here's the responsibilities. And we broke them out by percentage, all the way down to 5%. Here's the requirements. Um, so that's company A. Here's company B. Fortune Magazine lists company B as the number eight best healthcare employer in the country and number one on the West Coast. At company B, you will experience the pride, support, and respect that has been repeatedly recognized as one of the nation's top 100 places to work. You'll be, be surrounded by people committed to making a difference in the lives of their patients and their teammates. I'm not going to read the whole thing. You get the difference. Which one do you think is going to get more applications? It's obviously going to be the one on the right. It's going to be company B. Now, not everybody has those types of things that they can say are, are the selling points, but what are your selling points that you can have in there? What is it that we can do to get people to apply? Again, think about those semi-active candidates, not the active candidates. The active candidates, there's tons of competition for them. A lot of cases, there's a reason why they're highly active candidates. They're not around very long. Um, the semi-active in many cases can be a much, much better place for you to pull candidates from. And it's a much bigger group. 15% is unemployed and active. 25% uh, is, um, is semi-active. Okay, you're too slow. Again, I'm not trying to offend you or, or uh, uh, say that, that you're these things, but, but we tend to be too slow. We tend to be slower than we know is even reasonable when it comes to reaching out to candidates. So we need to ask yourself some questions. How long are my candidates available? If they're applying to a job on a website, realistically, how long are they available? And I ask people this question frequently. And the most common answers that I get are anywhere from a couple of hours to a day or two. And then I say, I ask them the next question, how fast are you getting to them? And the most common response is, within 48 hours usually. So I've got the same people that are saying, if I don't get to candidates within a couple hours, four hours a day, maybe two days, I don't have a good chance of getting them. By the way, um, studies have shown that if you don't get to them within the first couple of hours when they're applying to a job, because these are active job seekers, your chances of actually employing them drop by like 80 plus percent. So we've got, employers that are saying, yeah, I know that they're only going to be available for a few hours or one day, but I'm still not getting to them for two or three days. And sometimes I've seen people I haven't got to them for a week. I know that it's hard. I, I'm not making the rules. I'm just sharing that there's a disconnect in many cases between how long candidates are available and when we actually reach out to them. What percentage of my applicants apply during non-traditional business hours? Do we know that? Do we have a mechanism for actually addressing that? And then who is truly responsible in my organization for responding rapidly to all applicants? Do I have one person or maybe two people where it is their responsibility to reach out to all these applicants quickly, enthusiastically? Um, because if it's just kind of left open to this team of people or whoever gets to it first, then you've got a problem there. It's not enough of a priority for you to be able to, to really be competitive. So the strategy is to get there first. Um, first of all, assign responsibility. Have it be one person in your organization, two people in your organization. The less people that are responsible for it, the better, because then there's no dropping the ball or pointing fingers that, oh, I thought you were going to get them, uh, get that one. Eliminate unnecessary steps. We'll talk about that in a second. Anything that you can get rid of or that you can speed up is going to give you a better chance of getting those people through the door. Make speed a priority. 
How can we get this faster and faster and faster? And so it brings us to these candidate and employee falloff points. Um, and I use the analogy, as you can see the picture, of trying to catch water in our hands. We can catch water in our hands for a little bit, but the longer it stays in our hands, the more it's going to slip through our fingers. It's the same thing with candidates. The longer, more drawn out, more complicated the process is, the more candidates we lose. And so many people focus on candidate intake, which is bringing new people in, but we don't really focus on making the process as efficient uh, and positive as possible. And that's what we really need to do because we're just kind of, you know, just dying by slow cuts here if we let it keep going on. We keep losing people throughout the process. And we know we tend to lose the best people through the process too because they have lots of options. So think about your parts of the process all the way from candidate sourcing. Where am I sourcing them? What's my messaging? Uh, what's my application process? If you're sending them to your, your website and having them fill out an application, it should be no more than four fields and an upload of their resume. Anything more than that, we see a huge fall off rate. I was just talking to one of my clients where uh, they have over half of the people that started the application fell off. Well, when we looked at it, they had a four stage process for their application process. And so it's no wonder, and if, if anything, it's a wonder more people aren't actually falling off in that process. So it needs to be short, it needs to be quick, it needs to be easy, it needs to be mobile. Uh, it, everything that we can reduce friction is good. What's our lag between the application and the interview? We should be getting people in as quickly as possible. We should be reaching out to them as quickly as possible. Even if that's just a text that's enthusiastic, hey, thanks so much for applying. We can't wait to talk to you. Somebody's gonna be reaching out to you within the next few hours. In the meantime, if you wanna schedule a time for, uh, for an interview, here's a link to our calendar. Go ahead and we can do a 15 minute phone screen, whatever that might be. How, and of course, some positions do require obviously more requirements than others. There will be more unqualified applicants that apply to more skilled positions. So you have to take that in consideration. But we got to be fast. We got to get them in fast, as fast as we possibly can. Background check and drug screen. There are absolutely things that you have to do. There are requirements that you have. Uh, but can we speed that up? Are there ways to do it? Do we have the right providers? to help us do this as quickly as possible. It needs to be thorough, but there's lots of variation with background check companies and drug screen companies. So uh, how can we speed that up? Is there certain types of skills testing for certain types of positions? And um, you know, it, do we need to have those? Do we really, really need to have those? In some cases we absolutely do. In other cases we have them in there because we've always had them in there or because we used to get so many applicants that we had to figure out a way to screen some people out. And we see that a lot of times as well. It's an outdated skills test. Um, our interview and selection process, how long is the process? How many steps is it? How long does it take to do it? The shorter we can compress that, the better. Uh, sometimes we need to go through multiple steps. Sometimes there needs to be people involved that are not as available. We need to do our best to overcome that as much as possible. Lag from acceptance to start. How quickly can we get them to start? If they're an unemployed or active job seeker, they're going to want to start as soon as they possibly can. Uh, so if they're more of a semi-active that has a job, is going to give notice, all those things, we got a little bit more uh, time to do that. What's our onboarding process? And then also retention. So all of these things come into play. It's not just about posting jobs and processing applicants. There's a lot more that goes into it. How do we make every step in this process as efficient as possible? So let's talk about retention uh, for a little bit. And uh, I love this quote, you can choose to focus proactively on employee retention or you can react to employee turnover. Most of us react to employee turnover. Uh, and um, we also tend to not expect employee turnover. Well, the average length of, of tenure in the US before the pandemic, we're having trouble, we haven't seen new stats as far as what it is now, before the pandemic, it was only three years. And for uh, millennials and Gen Z, it was closer to 18 to 24 months. That number actually is, is shrinking even more. So if we think about even three years, 
That means that if we are consistent with the national average, a third of our team turns over every year, if we're just consistent with it. If we're better than that, then maybe 20% turns over, one out of five does. We still need to take that into consideration. We obviously need to try and minimize it as much as possible, but we need to understand that it's also a reality. Uh, we also need to understand that while we're talking about not having a fair share and we don't have enough pieces of the pie to go around to everybody, that means that others are continuously going after our employees. Uh, they're getting recruited on a daily basis in some cases. The pandemic, as all of you know, has also changed the way that people want to work in a lot of cases. So not only do we have less candidates, but we also have more candidates that don't want to work the traditional way that, that sometimes we need them to, or at least we want them to. We've seen a lot more people that are wanting to do uh, virtual or hybrid. Uh, sometimes that's possible. Sometimes it's not. You, you, know, you can't have somebody that is drawing blood remotely. Um, you can't have certain people that have to be there that can do it virtually. Uh, but in some cases, there are positions that we can do more virtually or hybrid. Uh, wage inflation has been skyrocketing for the last pretty much since the beginning of the year. It's, it's stabilized a bit. Um, we, we have not seen it go up as much in the last couple of months. Partly that's due to, to some, um, uh, you know, some uh, potential recession and some other things going on. Uh, but wage inflation, certainly for the first six months of the year, went up like crazy. Uh, there's a study that's done about every 10 years that looks at uh, retention drivers, and it's called the Emerging Workforce Study. And uh, this is just the top three reasons why people stay. In 2000, it was career growth, it was learning and development, was number one, challenging and exciting work, and meaningful work were the top three, okay? Uh, notice pay is not in there. 2010, learning and development opportunities, so that's the same here challenging or inspiring work. So it's changed a little bit from exciting to inspiring, making a contribution or a difference. You can see how people were evolving. Well, today, compensation's right at the top. Uh, it's usually one or two. We have also more around work-life balance. We've talked about work-life balance for two decades, at least, maybe longer than that, but now people really mean it. And so they want to have flexible work arrangements. They want to have, we talked about people wanting a couple part-time jobs instead of full-time. We want the people more and more want to have flexibility that work around uh, their home life. Uh, we would include virtual and hybrid in that as well. And then it has shifted from challenging and exciting to challenging or inspiring to what we call purpose-driven work. And we're seeing this particularly with newer generations. They want to have a job where they feel that they make a difference. And so you can see that in 2010, that was changing. That is just as important or more important than ever. So these are the things that attract people and get them to stay. And obviously the one, you know, it has to be a job that they, they like doing. It has, they have to have a supervisor that, that um, they like working for. There has to be certain other pieces to that as well. So some quick strategies for retaining employees. Not everybody can do this. Not everybody can do this um, for every position. Uh, what I would ask is that you think creatively about this. It's going to take creative solutions to solve this problem. Uh, expecting everybody to work 40 hour work weeks, the traditional work week is not probably going to be realistic. You're going to continue to struggle. So we have to look at, can we break up the 40 hour work week? Can we fill it by shift or by block? We you know, already see this a lot in healthcare organizations with per diem work. Um, so this is not unusual to particularly the healthcare profession. Uh, utilizing scheduling technology to make sure that it's covered. You know, we call job sharing sometimes. You, instead of having one full-time person, you have two part-time people. Different ways to go about that. Um, go remote when you can. I know that there are positions you can't. But there are also some positions where we are reluctant to do it, but we can. We can do it. Uh, we may have to make a couple of changes, but in a lot of cases, there are ones we can do. Candidates, uh, this is according to LinkedIn, candidates are two and a half as times as likely to apply to a remote job. Uh, before the pandemic, one in 67 jobs on LinkedIn were virtual. Today, that number is one in seven. That's what you're competing against now. Uh, can we do it? 
you got to talk through that, but you also have to go, let's not think about the way we've done things in the past. Let's think about what we need to do moving forward. And then take a look at your benefits as well. Uh, revisit, obviously, healthcare benefits are always important. Uh, paid time off benefits. Look at other types of benefits. Also, do you have benefits for part-time workers? At what point do they qualify? Most, uh, most companies don't have healthcare benefits until somebody averages 30, 32, 35 hours a week. Uh, we are seeing more companies that are looking at having part-time because if I can get somebody that works part-time for me, maybe they do another part-time job, they do a gig job, they're, they're filling that in. I'm the place that they're getting their benefits from. They're going to be more likely to stick around for us. Uh, and then also incentive programs that reward employees for working more hours as well. So if you have part-time people or people that can have flexible schedules, then how do you provide uh, incentive programs? Lots of companies do that. Uh, Uber is, is a good example of that, but there are all sorts of different companies out there that do those different things. Um, last thing I'll talk about retention is we people are going to stay at a company that they feel that they have connections to. It's much easier to leave a workplace when you don't feel connections, when you're not connected to your coworkers. If you don't look forward to seeing those people, if you don't interact with them, and if you don't feel proud of or understand the organization's mission and purpose. I've seen it in many cases where organizations have, have phenomenal missions, phenomenal purpose, but they assume that everybody kind of knows that and it's not really an area of focus. Uh, you've got to keep reminding people, you gotta keep focusing on that. Um, and so it, that's an important thing for people to feel like they have purpose-driven work. Last thing I'll talk about, and then I'll open it up. We'll have about 10 minutes for questions, uh, is the importance of online reviews. And we see this all the time. I see it in the recruiting industry, is that um, the, the number one most important content for job seekers, when they're deciding whether or not they want to take a job or interview or even consider uh, a company, is the online reviews or are the online reviews. One in three workers have declined an offer due to online reviews, and almost half of millennials have done. Uh, I can tell you from my own experience being in the recruiting industry, we have candidates all the time that come back and say, you know what, I checked out their online reviews, I don't want to interview for that company. And so we know that that happens on a frequent basis, and it's becoming more and more frequent. 92% of people consider online reviews important when they decide whether or not they're going to apply for a job. And so some things to take a look at, the online reviews you wanna make sure that you have good ones on are Google, Yelp, Indeed, Facebook, and Glassdoor. Not necessarily in that order, Google definitely is the beginning. Everybody starts with a Google search, a lot of these different online reviews will show up. If you have one or two reviews and you got a 5.0, don't feel comfortable with that. You're one review away from that dropping down to a three or a three and a half if somebody gives you a one-star review. So we want to make sure that we are driving people, driving our employees, driving our new employees, uh, as they onboard, send them to these different sites and say, tell, us, tell people about your experience. We want more good people like you to come, but we're only gonna do that if we get the word out that this is a great place to work. Um, and, um, uh, if you do have a negative re review, you want to make sure that there's a mechanism to respond to it quickly, positively, even if it's negative, even if it's untrue. We want to take the high road, be positive, because candidates can see over the course of time that, hey, listen, these are all good reviews. And this review that wasn't so good still had a positive response to it and a response that's trying to resolve it potentially or, or at least be positive in there. There's a pattern there. So those are the things that we want to do from an online standpoint. So that's all I got. Uh, there's my email address. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about anything. Uh, we're going to have a few minutes here for questions. Also, I would welcome anybody who wants to connect with me on LinkedIn. Feel free to reach out to me. Uh, but uh, I will uh, turn it over to Nicole and see if we have any questions. Thank you for that presentation, Tom. So if anybody has any questions, go ahead and type it into the chat box or feel free to unmute your line.
All right, I don't uh, see any questions coming in. Uh, any last uh, thoughts of wisdom you could share with us? <laughs> Yeah, I would, I would say, you know, I talked about a lot of stuff. Um, what I would say is if I kind of just simplify it into a couple of sentences, it's um, finding internal talent is one of the most important things, if not the most important thing that we can possibly do. If we don't have the right internal talent, we can't do our jobs. We can't function. We, the, the, you can't, yeah, you can't support your your patients and, and your customers. Um, so it is absolutely critical that it is more than an afterthought. And most employers uh, don't put the strategy towards it that there really needs to be. I would say the vast majority of, of people that are out there, uh, their strategy primarily is posting on job boards and hoping they get the right candidate. And as you can see from all the data that I put in there, all, all the way the pie charts and all that, um, that's just, it's not going to, it's not going to end up being successful for you. So we really have to be very strategic and, and purposeful about the different things that we do in order to get the right type of talent. And then we have to do everything we can to retain that talent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much again. I'm um, going to offer one more time. If you have any questions, unmute your line uh, to ask Tom before we let him go. All right. I guess there's no questions. Thank you again, Tom. I yep. really appreciate it. And uh, right. I'll definitely give you a follow on LinkedIn. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, everybody. Best of luck. Have a great afternoon. All right, so since there were no questions, we ended just a few minutes early. So we're gonna go ahead and just take a quick five minute break and we will return at 1.35. Thank you. So because we got a, because we have a, relatively a small and hopefully interactive group. Um, let's, uh, let's just take a minute or two and tell me your experience with burnout. What have you heard? What have you, what have you seen? What do you feel? Um, and just type that into chat if you can, so that we've got a chance to uh, hear a sense for, for where you are as we, as we start. And as you're doing that, I'll, I'll share a little bit about my background and we'll give Terry a chance to, to share some of hers. Um, you know, I started experiencing burnout and uh, talking about it, writing about it back in 2003. And I was working with some, uh, some folks and we were starting to see that we didn't feel like we were getting the right things done. It felt overwhelming. It felt like there was never ending. It felt... Uh, you know, it, it, it just felt too, like too much. And that was fine. I wrote a couple of things and, and whatever. And, and we got to um, 2018, 2017, 2018. And I realized that what I knew about burnout wasn't enough. Uh, and that's because. That's when I was in burnout. Um, and feel free, turn on your cameras if you want. This is interactive. Um, it's great to see your faces. Um, and, and we are getting some notes in the chat too. Yep. Um, so I'm a pediatric clinical nurse specialist. Um, I used to support the Hemox stem cell pick you and burn units of a pediatric hospital um, and saw horrible things. But what my latest burnout event was related to one of our children. We have seven children. Um, and I know you probably have never experienced this. We have one child who is making decisions that, you know, really were not in his best interest. Um, and, and that piece of not being able to help him really dove me into burnout. Right. It felt like there was no way to, to control or even influence what he was doing. Right. So have you, have you heard, and in, in as we try and um, get started, have you heard people say, if you just do this, it'll solve burnout? Or have you heard people talk about stress 
And again, if you can if you can throw that into the chat a little bit, we'll uh, we can see that and we can respond to that. Um, and we think that you know one of the challenges with burnout is we have these feelings and you know exhausted and overwhelmed, compassion fatigue, pand pandemic fatigue. Um, we we have all these feelings, um, but but everybody has their their kind of um, I'll call it pop psychology answer for where how do you solve that, right? Like, oh, just take a vacation. And you're like, okay, well, that's fine while I'm on vacation if I don't get calls from the office. Um, you know, or do yoga. Or do yogurt. Yoga. Yoga. Okay. Um, but do those really help? Have you, have you tried them and have you seen, you know what, that really just doesn't get me where I want to go. So as we start, I want you to think about, um, you know, did you, when you were young, did you dream about what you would be? I'm sure we all did. Um, and once you decide what it was you were gonna be, you were gonna change the world, right? And whether you're exactly where you thought you'd be as a child or not, um, you got to that point that you went to school, you learned all the things, and then you launched out into the world to make a difference. And things were going great and you were making a difference until all of a sudden it felt like you couldn't. You just couldn't do the things you wanted to do. You couldn't make the things happen that you felt like you had to. Did anybody ever feel that way? Like, and a light question is, have any of you ever experienced burnout? You can raise your hand, you can put it in the chat, but have any of you, you come ever? Come off mute. Yeah, come off mute. So one brave soul, Nicole, thank you. You have been in burnout. I'm sorry, but thank you for sharing. Um, Usually when we ask that question, almost everyone in the audience says, yes, yes, I've been in burnout. And many people are like, yes, right now I'm in burnout. That's where I'm at. Well, burnout is epidemic. Um, if you look solely at healthcare, about 61% of healthcare providers are in burnout currently. And then you look at first responders and you look at critical care nurses. Um, and all of a sudden you realize that there's a lot of people around us that are living in burnout. Um, but before we figure out how to solve it, I think we need to look at where we're going and yeah. We so, going? so what we'll talk about, and and if if we all decide that we don't want to go this way, like if you've got a, a subtopic or a part of this that you want to talk about, we're happy to adjust. But our agenda is to talk about what is burnout because we we talk about it, but, but it's really generally fuzzy for, for most folks. We'll do a little bit of work on identity, and then we'll go to resilience. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about goals. And we'll try and finish up with a little bit about changing attitudes. So we will not have time to do exercises during, during our time today, but you can go to this URL and you can get a set of exercises that you could do if you're in burnout, if someone else uh, in your office has been burnout, the exercises are, are really kind of the application of what we're going to talk about today. And these really can help someone avoid or escape burnout. So we'll, uh, we'll get that URL in the chat here in just a second or two, but, but let's start with what is burnout. So historically burnouts can try the three things. Um, I want you to think about the three and one of these are not like the other. Think back to Sesame Street when like, hey, which of these things is not like the other? Um, the first one is exhaustion. And, and Nicole, you mentioned that is that total feeling of you just have no energy. You have no capacity, no energy to do anything. Um, the second is cynicism. And I like to think about that. If any of you remember Mr. Wilson on Dennis the Menace, um, they're sitting on the porch grouching about that dang kid and how he's not doing anything. We'll become cynical when we feel like we can't make a difference. Um, we feel like no matter what it is we do in the world, it's not going to get better. And, and you get cynical. Yeah. And yeah. then the third one is inefficacy, where you just don't feel like you can get the things done that you believe you should be able to get done. So if you looked at those, which one of those is not like the other? Which one of those is maybe the causal factor of burnout? Could it be exhaustion or cynicism or inefficacy? And totally okay to unmute and talk. Do you have a guess? I, I, I've seen, I, I I've seen the, the back of the book. I, I know that, so the thing is, right, like, so, if you look at the top one exhaustion, right? Like I remember, I don't know if you guys had this experience like Disneyland or, or something. And 
as a kid, me and my sister come out. My, my sister is doing cartwheels in the parking lot on the way out of Disney World. And I was like, I'm exhausted. But it didn't mean I was in burnout. I meant I had a really great time, right? And, and so I think exhaustion is, a, is not that thing, right? It's something you can experience in burnout, but it isn't necessarily a thing that you go, oh, if they've got that, then they're definitely- It's a symptom, not a cause. Right, it's a symptom, not a cause. Uh, cynicism is interesting because cynicism is really simple. Like most people are like, oh, cynicism is bad. It's, it's really simple to explain cynicism. Cynicism is what happens after you no longer feel effective, right? The guys that are that are on the front porch playing checkers and, and, and being cynical about the world, they're cynical about the world because they don't believe they can make a change any longer, right? And if you think about the people in, in your office who are cynical, do not name names, but if you think about the people in your office who are cynical, they're people who no longer feel like they have the opportunity to make change. Um, so that leads us with just the inefficacy right. at the core. Right. And when you can't do the things that you feel like you should and, and look around your office, who are the people that, you know, that are in burnout and do they feel like they're being effective? Right. Um, how about if we look at the bathtub model? Yeah, let's, let's take a look at the bathtub model. So this is a simple visual that we use to help people understand why they're in burnout how the burnout functions and all things. And so, so I'm gonna give you a quick overview and then we'll take each piece in detail. So the very center of it is the personal agency bathtub. The water in that bathtub is your personal agency, your ability to get things done. It is filled by three things. It's first, the results that you accept. The second thing is the support you ask for and receive. The third is the self-care that you do. And then finally, the piece at the bottom of the model are the demands. And you're like, oh, I've got lots of demands, right? All of these have valves. All of these are adjustable. All of these are things that you can adjust with the idea of maintaining some personal agency. And personal agency means you feel effective. Yeah, and I think um, one of the things as a leader is to recognize that it's not just your employees, the people you lead that can adjust those valves, but how do you provide? How do you provide the support and how do you recognize the results? And how do you model the behavior? Right. Right. Like, right. how do you give that example? Because that's how you can really change your office culture. Um, when we talk about personal agency, it really is just your capacity to get things done. Um, and it's measured in three things. It's measured in our strength. You know, do I physically have the ability to do something? Lift heavy things. Right. Do I have the skills? Do I know how to do it? And do I have the time? So when we really think about personal agency, um, sometimes people will call it your reserves. Um, it's do I have the ability to get things done? Yeah. So that's really but, what you're trying to keep. And that's what we're trying to keep. We're trying to keep some level of that. When personal agency gets too low, that's burnout, right? When you feel like you have nothing left, you can no longer make a change, you're in burnout. So the top thing that'll fill your personal agency is results. And that's the recognition that you get. And whether, whether that is external in the form of awards, um, you know, or mentions, and maybe it's a promotion and, and, and maybe there's money involved, but, but those are external results. Those are things that uh, uh, can happen. Then there are internal results. And these are things, this is the acceptance of it, right? I mentioned that, you know, people with people, when they have someone comes to them and they go, well, you did a great job. The answer shouldn't be, well, anybody could have done it or it's okay, or it's not, the, the answer is thank you, right? And because th that's because you want to accept that as a result and recognize it because that will help you feel like you're getting some results. It actually, it actually changes the way you start to think about things. And so, you know, one of the tips for leaders is how do you start to model that behavior of thank you, right? And how do you encourage it? When you give someone a compliment, when you say, hey, you did a really great job with that patient with this thing, and here's, you know, the impact of that, that's, that's great. And they go, oh, anybody could have done it. You go, no, 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 the, the right answer to that is thank you, right? Like everybody couldn't have done that. That's why I took the time to tell you how important it was. Um, some, of our, some of our results are tangible, right? Like just completion, just taking care of something. Um, and, then, and then, you know, obviously there are financial rewards at some point, but, but financial rewards, by the way, are actually a very minor aspect of the way that we think about our results. So yes, it's there, it's a check mark, but we don't, we don't think about, oh my gosh, I earned $1.50 instead of $1.25, I'm 25% better or whatever that is, right? We don't think that way. That's not the way our brains work. So the second thing that fills our 
personal agency or this support. And, you know, it's interesting when you start thinking about communities growing is that it's a community. Um, it's people need other people. Um, you need people to, you know, I personally don't think I have the capacity to provide the food and the electricity and the water and all those things for our family, even together. I don't think we can do that, but, but you depend on other people to get their support to be able to be successful. Um, no one in your office can run your office without all the other people. Um, when I'm working in the hospital, I tell EVS workers every day that, you know what, you're as important as the surgeon that's doing the surgery that's bringing patients in. Who does not, by the way, believe that. The surgeons do not believe that's equal. Well, okay, but, um, but honestly, we all need one another to be able to be successful. And there's different kinds of support um, and it's being able to accept it as well as to give it. And sometimes I think- And ask for it, right? Like we right. have to be able to ask for support. In healthcare, um, I think we struggle greatly. I can say personally, I struggle greatly asking for help or admitting that I might need help, um, even though people are willing to give it. Um, so we talk about different types of support. We have material support, and that could be financial and it could be non-financial, right? Like, you know, do you help people by giving them money? Do you help people by doing something for them? Um, it can be emotional support. You know, how many times is it that someone really just needed someone to listen and make them feel heard to be able to feel like they were being effective. Um, and then there's systemic support. And that's how do you build a system to help people be successful? You start building systems for support and then it becomes natural and, and just happens. Um, and you have different areas of, of support. And I think it's interesting, the World Health Organization has listed burnout as an occupational, um, not a hazard, occupational condition. condition. Um, you know, and when we started talking, we talked about how my ex last experience with burnout had nothing to do with my work. It had to do with family. So all those places that we live, whether it's at work or at home or in our social environments, we can get burnout. But those are also the places that we get support. And those are the places that we need to look for and ask for support. And this last one is personal support. How do we personally help ourselves? And that really is a big part of self-care. Right. Now, let's see, you know, and you might even say it's the same thing. It's just a different name. And that's, that's probably true. Uh, but self-care is so important to our ability to avoid burnout that it deserves, it deserves its own space. And I think one of the challenges with folks, uh, there, there's two pieces, right? Like, so, so Terry was talking about, how, you know, how do we do support? And I think we sometimes forget that you cannot give what you don't have that you need to be putting on your own mask first. These are things that-, that But they, it doesn't apply to us. Right, it totally makes sense as long as it's not about us, right? And, and I think that we look at self-care, it is super important. And we have this tendency to perhaps look at it like it's self-indulgence or if I'm helping myself then I'm not helping other people and I should be here to help. Like, but what we, what we fail to realize is we've got to take care of ourselves first. It's not self-indulgent. It is not self-indulgence. Um, so there are physical aspects of this. There's exercise. Um, and we, we recently were at Rocky Mountain National Park. And she bought me a shirt because I say that I only run when chased. And the shirt actually says you only have to be faster than one other member of your party um, if you're attacked by a bear. So, you know, I, exercise is an important part of it. Diet is an important part of it. Sleep. Um, and I think we underestimate the value and the importance of sleep. There's drinking, um, hydration, hi hydration. Drinking isn't bad. It's drinking just, it's not bad in it's moderation. Right. right. But, but we, but you also should be hydrating. Um, I was in a, was in a meeting yesterday and this, this, this woman had this like massive water container. It was a day container. Yeah. It was like massive. And I'm like, how, you know, what is that for curls? You doing exercise here? Just, no, it's, it's 64 ounces of water to drink over the course of the day. Right. I know. By every two hour increments. Yeah. No, it, it was cool and weightlifting. Anyway, uh, there's the psychological side of things. You know, how do you deal with your self talk? How do you um, make sure that you're doing rejuvenating actions? Those things that bring you life, that make, that make you feel more alive. Uh, and, and how do you use coping strategies? Um, I think that coping strategies are one of those things where you're like, oh, it's a coping strategy. It's not very good. Coping strategies are actually really important mm -hmm. as a part of an overall plan, right? You don't want to just use coping strategies. You don't want to come home every night and go, hey, it's two, it's two glasses of wine every single night. But 
you know, there are hard days when that's an appropriate answer. I think as a leader, before we go on to demands the other side, um, modeling self-care, like it's, it's incredibly helpful if you tell your staff, hey, I'm taking a mental health day. I'm going to go. I'm going to get a massage. I'm going to do whatever because sometimes I need to refill myself. Um, that makes it so that it is permissible and encouraged for your for you know the people that you're with to do the same thing. You know, all these pieces, results, self care, and support. Um, we think about how do we help other people to be able to utilize those because it's much easier to say no, I don't need it. I I'm a nose to the grindstone type of girl, grindstone type of girl. Yeah, yeah. Um, that you know I'm here to get my job done and I want to do a great job and I want you to be happy with it. Um, but we want people to be healthy. Right. Right. Yeah, I was talking to a leader in, in uh, real estate and he was asking, he's like, well, how do I, how do, how do I model this? I'm like, okay, well, tell me a little bit more about your world. Blah, blah, blah. Oh yeah, my wife is pregnant. It's our first child and it'll be great. I'm like, cool. How many of the doctor's visits have you been to? And he got really quiet and he got kind of, and I'm like, no, you should go. Like, this is an example. This is the way that you set the example and I'm not saying don't make up the time somewhere else. That's not what I'm saying. But but say that, you know what? It's really important for me to be with my wife while we go to these doctor's appointments because this is a super important thing. And, um, you know, he he didn't quite understand that uh, at first. And I, I think I got him there. Um, I hope that it helped this marriage. I assume it helped this marriage because I, I know that's a good thing. But But these are just simple little signals that you can send to other people that that help the folks that you're working with make sense of what self-care is supposed to mean. Right, yeah, and it's important. So the other side of, of the bathtub is demands and there's physical demands um, and there's psychological demands. Um, and the thing is they can both be limited. And so how do we limit our demands and why would we want to like, hey, if I can do all the things, um, well, I only have so much reserves, right? I only have so much personal agency. I only have so much time. Um, so how do I manage that? Well, I could develop boundaries and we're gonna talk more about boundaries here in just a little bit. And then you have decision-making criteria. And I think that's something we don't always think about is what I'm doing have as much impact as the effort I'm putting in. Um, actually, you know what? Right. That is not right. Yeah, so decision-making so, so. Decision criteria. So we, with our six kids, seven kids, um, growing up, we said you can be in one, one activity. One activity at a time, you have to finish the activity, and then we can talk about a different activity. So if you're in gymnastics and you're like, hey, I really want to do dance, well, that's great, but we're not going to talk about it for this six-week period that we're in gymnastics. Um, already having that decision made makes it so much easier to limit your demands. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to talk about it. And you can say, yep, absolutely. When we get close to the end of this, we can decide what you want to do next. Yeah. yeah. So what I was really thinking about, and it's, it's the season of, of Thanksgiving coming up, and it's solving trade imbalances. And that's when the effort you're putting in, does it really get the results that you're looking for? Um, Rob's family, his grandma used to have these amazing Thanksgivings, and it was turkey, and it was all the things, and it was all the pies and dumplings and noodles, and it's great. Um, and when she passed, our aunt said she was going to take on that role. She wanted to, to you know, she was going to be the matriarch. She was the only daughter. And she started doing all those things and having this huge Thanksgiving dinner and people would come and they would eat and they'd lay down. And I don't know what it is about football that puts everyone to sleep, um, but our aunt put weeks in preparation, working really hard and then hours in cleanup where people really didn't get that benefit. They got together and they went to sleep. Um, so it changed. She decided to start going to state parks in, in Indiana. Um, the state parks have a huge smorgasbord for Thanksgiving. All the starches and sugars that you could ever possibly want and more. Yeah, ham, turkey, prime rib, and fish. Um, more things than you'd ever want. But then nobody cooks, nobody cleans, nobody does the shopping. Um, and they have activities for the family to do together. So you really are building that community that she wanted without this incredible workload that you know, was just too much. Um, yeah, we pretended that the hike that we did after the meal yeah. worked off the meal. That was self-care, that was mental. Mm, yeah, no, that was, that was that was not exactly. Yeah. And then you have this perspective. How many times um, have you said, "Oh, I have to do something"? Your your child comes home, or your significant other says, "Hey, I need to do this. It has to be tonight, and I need your help." Like, oh, I have to help, or do you get to help? Hey, they want my help, and I get some individual time with them. Um, and they're kind of stuck talking to me because they want my help. So it's, it's how do we change our perspective to being to, I have to do things to I actually get to, it's right. a choice. And so, so the story that I, that I share with this, so there is nothing 
in our marriage license or in the vows that say, I have to make coffee. There's no coffee clause. I didn't think right? about it, but you know, yeah. if you have an opportunity in the future, yeah. coffee clauses are great. Right. <laughs> but, but the thing is, right, like, so I make coffee for her every morning and I don't drink coffee, right? Like I take my caffeine in a cold suspension fluid. And yes, by the way, I know there's iced coffee, but, but I take my caffeine in a cold suspension fluid and she likes coffee. And so I make her coffee every morning. And and over time, it's evolved, right? But at some point, I think there was a, a still and a distillery and all kinds of stuff. In fact, we're getting a water distiller soon. But, but the, the thing is, I don't have to do this, right? Like nobody says I have to make coffee. It's great though. I make coffee because I get to. It's a simple, tiny little thing that I can do that says to her, hey, I love you and I want you to be happy. And is it a demand for me? to make coffee oh, at some level. Yeah. Like it is takes time and stuff and things. And right. Like, but on another level, I can choose to have that demand be heavy, have to, or it can be light if I choose to look at it from a get to perspective. Right. So we've been looking at personal agency um, and let's change to efficacy. Yeah. So I think you know, when we look at the personal agency model, it's kind of a current and forward model, right? It's a model of well, what do I have? What can I do today? And what will I be able to do in the future? And that's great. But sometimes when people look at things, um, when we get to burnout, we've actually made an evaluation. So, so when we when we talk about agency, it's about cast, capacity, capability, and reserve, right? But what happens is this other side, which is this feeling of efficacy, this feeling that we're effective. Remember, you know, it's it's our uh, feelings of inefficacy that we we talked about at the very beginning in, in terms of the the definition of burnout, and so efficacy is past looking. It's evaluating what did we do, and it did it fit. It's, it's it's assessing. It's it's our perspective of what really happened. And and as we first started into the pandemic, I think as people went home and as people did different things, we all had these kind of radically weird perceptions of what we should be able to do and what we shouldn't be able to do. And, and even we as, really know. right. But we made up some answer that, that generally appeared to be very similar to what we, we started with. Right. And as we start coming back to the office and then masks and unmasks and, and all the extra protocols and, and how do we look at our efficacy across that? And a lot of people judge themselves harshly, right? They judge themselves. I'm not getting enough done. Thus, we ended up with burnout. But um, we have this idea that perception is not reality. We want you to understand that perception is not reality. So here's what we're going to ask you to do. Um, I'm going to ask you to pull up the chat window if you don't have it open. And I'm going to ask you to be ready to type because we're going to show you an image and we're going to ask you to type into the chat or, see. or come off mute, right? If you want to come off mute and, and just kind of scream it out to the rest of us, that's totally fine too. But, but at the very least, go into chat and be prepared to send us a, uh, a, a what you see. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you the image. I'll give you a second or two to type it in, and I'll ask you to hit enter all at the same time. So here's our first image. We're going to do two of these, right? And you may have seen this image before. Uh, even if you have, I've got some really great uh, answers that we've gotten as we've shared this with other groups. Yeah, we've got some answers I've never heard before. There, yeah, there's some there's some really good stuff. Like, so if you're, you know, if you're, you're having trouble figuring out what you're seeing here, um, we'll give you some be creative. answers. Yeah, be creative. That's fine. All right. So count of three. Yep. One. Do I do the count? Two, three. All right. Somebody hit enter. Lady, woman. Lady, lady with a veil. Yeah. Yep. A veil. Yeah. Yeah. So, so here's the Anybody thing. Anybody else? So, Typically, when people see this image, they see one of two things. They typically see an old woman. She's got a veil. She's got a shawl over her head, and her mouth is there. And um, she's looking down. To the she's, left. Looking, she's looking down and to uh, the left. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's one person. That's one thing that they see. The other thing sometimes people see is a young woman who is looking away, and she's got a little feather in her cap, and right. And that's the other thing that people see. Now, which one's right? I like the eagle eating a fish the best. <laughs> that is one of the other uh, 
that is one of the other uh, things that we've discovered is that sometimes people say that there's an eagle or a bird eating a fish. Um, you can sort of make that shawl look a like spot. a bird. Um, so that's that's great that yeah. you see both. Yep. Yeah. So those are those are. So who's right? Is there a right answer? No, there's not a right answer. That's that's actually the point, right? Like so, as we do this evaluation, we do these evaluations, we end up with this thought about where, whether we're effective or not. You know, hey. I don't know that it matters, right? Like, I think we should check with other people. Do other people see things the same way or do they see something different? So let's do one more real quick. Um, again, uh, take a look at that second image there. Pre-type in what you think you might see. And, uh, and then we'll give you the count of three. But I want to do the count. I've been saving these guys from you and the count. But if you'd like to, guys, I'm sorry in advance, but he really likes this. I do love this. So so if you have young children or if you ever watch Sesame Street, you know there's the count, right? And the count counts. And uh, so, so on the count of three, I'll ask you to, to put in what you what you see, okay? Yep. One, ha, ha, ha. Two, ha, ha, ha. Three, ha, ha, ha. Okay, so that's the count. Okay, um, so we have rabbits and ducks. We have ducks and rabbits. That's great. Yep. Yep. That's yep. very often what we get is ducks and rabbits. Um, if you if you see the duck but not the rabbit, think of the bill as the ears, and vice versa. If you see the rabbit, not the duck, but think of the the ears as as the bill, and that pretty much will get people to be able to see both of them. Right. The idea really is that it doesn't matter what we see or what we. It's all about what we perceive. Um, and many times on our efficacy, we perceive ourselves to be effective or not, but it's not really built on reality. Right. So we we sort of we sort of talked about this, so so we'll do it a little quickly. Um, but you know, your expectations they can be conscious or they can be unconscious. Oh yeah. So you should tell them about dishes in the sink. So guys. Have you ever been told or have the belief or maybe somewhere along the way, someone told you that if you go to bed with dishes in the sink, it's a really bad thing. And it's really bad because if your house catches on fire, the firemen will see dishes in your sink and they won't put out the fire. Now, that was not my idea. My mother told me, but I hear it myself all the time when I'm like, oh, I'm really tired. I don't want to do dishes. Oh, you better do the dishes because there could be a fire. Um, but it's this, you know, it's this perception, is this unconscious belief that came from, you know, my mom that somehow became real. And yes, I know. I mean, we have a son who's a fireman. He assures me that they don't look at the sink before they put out a fire. <laughs> They're a little more focused on the fire. Not really sure why, but they seem to think that fire is more important than dishes. But, but we all have things that we believe as truth that maybe isn't really true. Right. Right. So we so we have some conscious and unconscious expectations. And really, we want to measure that and get our results and, and evaluate that based on the feedback that we get. And by the comparison, you know, if other people are ineffective, too, because of all the changes and all, the, you know, maybe new, do a new system rollout or you do something. If they're ineffective, too, the fact that you're ineffective is probably not a reflection on you personally. And you want feedback from people you trust. Yeah, definitely feedback people you trust. Um, so we're going to talk just a little bit more about uh, reframing perceptions, and, and this is uh, this is a picture of Mount Rushmore. You're like, oh yeah, I got that, um, but it's also a picture that you've probably never seen before, right? Uh, most people have never seen Mount Rushmore from the air. You, most of the time, you go to the visitor center, you look up, and you're like, oh, big statues, and they are. But when you look at them from the perspective of uh, the the broader mountain range and the fact that it's South Dakota and they have a uh, park named the Badlands. Um, they, they, they've got a lot else going on besides Rushmore and, and they're to focus on just the statues and the amazing statues um, to focus on that misses kind of the broader picture. And so we want to ask you to kind of look at the, the broader picture of what you're getting done, what you're getting accomplished and the way that you see yourself. So we think about identity and, and I'm going to encourage you to do the workbook. And, and if you want to do it with your office group or if you want to do it with your family, um, there's a, there's an interesting part about our identity and there's not a single one of us that are a single individual. Like I may be a wife and a mother and a nurse and a friend and a daughter and I'm all those things. 
right? Those are those are our aspects of our identity, right? These are things that we we may uh, think define who we are, or they can be more aspirational. So, for instance, I have a private pilot's license, and I've not flown in several years. I've not flown in several years because even though like I have the license and I can, you really um, if you're going to do that, you should be safe, and that means a time commitment, and I can't really do that right now. And so, what are the aspects of your identity that you're like, mm, that's me, or and what what ones are, mm, you know, I can defer this for now, or this can be later, or it's just more aspirational. I want to get there, right? Like maybe I want to scuba dive or something, but I don't, but I can't. Um, and so we have kind of this, we have this sense that we are one person, but really there's all these aspects that we have. And each of them come with some sort of an expectation and activity. As I said, flying, um, I need certain number of hours just to maintain proficiency. I need to make sure that I continue to be safe. And, and so I would have to count that in of how much time would it take for me to feel like I'm a competent pilot. Um, expectations, you know, I, I don't know, uh, if you are a parent and your child is in uh, your child is in elementary school and they have the like the the den the room moms and the and the parties with all the cookies and the like what are the expectations that you have as a part of being a parent not just as a taxi slash uber service but also as all a, of those other things do you buy cookies at the grocery or do you make them right big difference in time commitment and it's, it's based on what your expectation is right like if you're like my mom always cooked cookies for my class right and you, then you try to do that on top of everything else you're doing so one of the um, activities that's in the workbook um, helps you walk through that like how much time does it take to meet all your expectations and your activities how much time i mean we all have to sleep hopefully we're getting six to eight hours of sleep a night but you know that's a hope we all have to eat we need to take showers so we need to commute um, we have to work those all take time. So when you start looking at all the time that is required to do all the things that you expect of yourself, um, what we find out is that people get the high score, not the low score. Yeah, they think that like, this is a game that you want golf, right? Like you want low scores, not the, yes, I have 300 hours. By the way, there's 168 in a week. Yeah, but I can only be effective if I have 300. Right, you're not gonna be effective if you think it's 300 and there's only 168. Wow. Unless you can slow the rotation of the earth. And apparently NASA says that's not possible. So then how do we really adjust our expectations so that what we expect of ourselves is something that's realistic that we can do? Right. How do we ground those in? And part of it is recognizing that you have more to do, more expectations and activities than you can fit in a week. And then what do you do to scale back on some of those expectations and activities? Maybe you buy the cookies versus making them. Maybe you say, I'm going to be a little more aspirational about this aspect of my life, and I'm going to take a couple of those expectations off or something so that you can get to, it doesn't take you more than 168 hours in a given week to be effective at all the activities and, and expectations that you have. And so that exercise, we, I would say that probably 5% of the people that we do that exercise with get less than 168. Um, and really, it, you need to be less than 168 to have time just to do the fun things you want to do. Right. Right. Like you want to be able to just enjoy life. Um, and when we book ourselves so tightly that we don't have any capacity to do that. Right. So this is Lone Cypress. It's actually, it's in California. You guys it probably is. all know this um, story well better than we do. Um, but it's, you know, this cypress is on the top of a cliff by Carmel by the sea. And it's not a great place for a cypress tree to grow. There's wind, there's salt water, um, there's not great dirt, um, but it's persevered there. It has a resilience to, to survive in a place that's not really meant for it. Um, and that's what we want to do with resilience. It's more than just you know, I don't know if you guys have had facilities to say, hey, we're going to do yoga once a month, and that's how we're going to combat burnout. It doesn't work. But there's more to resilience than just, you know, yoga. Yeah. So think about, and I would love you to, to type in the chat, how do you talk to yourself? What are the things you say to yourself? Do you say, wow, I did a great job today? Or do you say, oh my gosh, I can't believe I was so stupid. I put my foot in my mouth. They must think I'm a ridiculously horrible human. Um, so are you friendly to yourself? What do you guys think? Do you talk to yourself nicely? 
do talk to yourself. Yeah, and if you answer yourself, that's that's okay. Too. A, yeah, just it's yeah. okay. So in general, people don't talk to themselves as nicely as they could. Um, you know, we've been known to talk to ourselves really pretty horribly. Um, the things we say to ourselves aren't things that we would say to our best friend. Um, it's not something we say to people we love. And then inside that, you have these external voices, and it can be something from a coach or a teacher or a parent somewhere along the way that said something to you that then you believe. That you're like, oh my gosh, you know, my, my house has to be clean when people come over or they're going to think I'm a horrible person. Um, and that's not true, but you take all these things and you make them your own voice. So what we need to do is we really want to work to, to remove these negative patterns. Instead of saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe how horrible I did. It could be, you know what? I tried really hard. I didn't do as great as I thought I would, but it was still okay. Um, so start working on how do you talk differently? Focus on friendly and cooperative, compassionate. Um, if your significant other or your best friend would be really mad at somebody, if they said the things you say to yourself, you probably need to change what you're saying to yourself. Yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah. the way that Terry talks to herself is not the way I would let any other human talk to her. Um, and I think we all do that, right? Like we all talk to ourselves and we said it's not very positive. So we talked about the aspects of our identity, but, but what is the benefit of really recognizing those aspects of our identity and integrating our self-image, right? We, we tend to see ourselves in these aspects, right? Like, oh, I'm a good parent or I'm a bad parent or I'm a good spouse or I'm a bad spouse or whatever it is, right? And, and, and we kind of laser focus in on each of these different views. When we can start to integrate them, it changes the way we see ourselves and the way we see the world. You see, the thing is, if you start to see yourself as five aspects or 10 aspects, and you're doing a pretty darn good job in most of them, maybe one of them, you're like, nee, right? You can, you can give yourself some grace. You cannot have that self-talk that is, oh, I'm awful, right? You can go, you know, I'm doing these things really, really well. This one I got to work on. But you know what? Everybody has something to work on, right? Even Ben Franklin, right? Like Ben Franklin had these virtues and he would work on a virtue for a while and the other virtues would fall off and he'd work on another virtue. And like, there's always something to work on. When you can see yourself as all of those things and you put those together, you end up reducing that negative self-talk and you start to better accept, yeah, we've all got flaws. We've all got them, right? And so how do we start to not pick ourselves apart about the, I'm the great administrator and my office runs really, really smoothly. And, and, oh, by the way, you know, I've got a teenager that hates me, by the way, that's normal. Um, right. Like, but you don't have to like measure yourself, um, against that one area. You can start to, to see things more broadly. Right. And, and in the end, all of us need to accept that we have value. Um, you know, and how do you share that among the people you work with? How do you help them to understand they have value. And sometimes it's just telling them. Yeah. And, and, and it's how do we create that environment where we're supporting one another? You know, we, we, we've been in these environments, probably all of us have been in the environments where everyone was kind of catty and they were all kind of me, me right? And, and you look at that and that is a place where nobody wants to be. Um, conversely, we've probably been in a place that has twice as much work, 10 times as much work, the objective measures of it would be, this is an awful place to work. Oh my gosh, you realize how much productivity you have to have and blah, 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 blah. But the whole team works together. Right. And if one person has a little capacity more, they offer to help the other person. Right. And it becomes, it just becomes the norm of to help one another. Right. And, and you know, and our daughter is a nurse and has spent some time on inpatient units and she spent them in, in the ER. She's kind of floated around on different things. And, you know, being in ER is hard work. No, no question, but I can tell you that her experience in the ER in terms of teamwork and supporting one another was so much better than when she was doing inpatient. And, you know, it's like, well, I'm gonna do my patients and you do your patients, blah, blah, blah. And, and the ER, like it doesn't work that way, right? And people recognize that and they start to support each other so that they can all be successful together. So um, we said we would come back to boundaries. Terry said we'd come back to boundaries and I do wanna cover that. Um, there's two things about boundaries, and when we first explained this to our kids, I think we did a bad, we did a bad job, yeah, right? Sure. Because they're like, boundaries, you can't do that to me. And I'm like, mm, no, boundaries is I'm not going to do this, or I'm not going to accept this, or I'm not going to, right? It's all inward focus. It's not about other people. It's about what I'm going to do, 
right? And how I'm going to respond. Right. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to stand here and be yelled at. Right. It's different than you can't okay. yell at me because of my boundary. Right. Right. And, and, and it sounds like you're like, oh, that's semantics, but it's important because what, what, what starts to happen if you don't think about boundaries that way is you forget that it's about being you being you. Right. And there's two different kinds of boundaries. There's a permanent and defining boundary. This is a, this is who I am. If, if I were to violate this thing, it would change who I am. Right. And if you're a, if you're a vegan and you suddenly have steak, that would change who you are. And, and it's a, it's a thing about who you want to be. Right. The other kind of boundaries, a temporary or protective boundary. Hey, right now, my arm is broken or I've had carpal tunnel surgery and I can't pick up heavy things, right? Um, pain. It, it is a pain. And, but, but that's temporary, right? That's a don't lift things more than 10 pounds for two weeks or whatever it is, right? That's temporary. It's still a boundary. It's still not something you're going to do. It's not, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna do this because it's gonna hurt me or whatever, but it's temporary. And I think as we talk about uh, earlier, we were talking about demands and how do you manage them and what do you do with that? And one of those ways is to manage your boundaries and say, this is who I am. This is not who I am. Hey, you're going to ask me to do something unethical. I think is unethical. That's for me, it's morally wrong. I'm not going to do it. Right. And that's a nice, clear boundary. Uh, Jack Canfield. And this is the guy that wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul, right? Like that whole thing. Um, and, and by the way, I'm quoting here just so we're all clear. He says 99% is a bitch. 100% is a breeze right? In other words, when you know where those boundaries are, it gets so much easier. Yes, no. There's not a lot of maybe. Not a lot of yellow lights. It's green or red. The other thing is, um, and this is from Carol Dweck's work, is mindset. You know, there's different mindsets and there's a fixed mindset, which says that, you know, my capacity is fixed. Um, we have kids that say, oh, I can't learn math. Um, that's a fixed mindset. It's not that she couldn't learn math. Actually, she ended up learning math and physics. Um, but it's this other mindset. It's the growth mindset that says, you know what? If I try hard enough, I can do it. I can learn anything. I can grow. I have to work at it. It's not going to come naturally always. But when you start to believe that you can learn whatever, you can do whatever it is you put your mind to, um, that's that growth mindset that really opens up the world to you. Right. Right. And I think when we get when we get burned out, we've evaluated, oh my gosh, I'm not doing as good as I can do, right? The reality is, is we can all get better, right? If you look at the work of um, Anders Ericsson, and Robert Poole, they published a book called Peak. Uh, and it's, by the way, the, the research that they did was picked up by Malcolm Gladwell on Tipping Point. And it says, oh, 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours is a myth. But, but the point is that the people who are really good at whatever, and whether it's golf or chess, or whatever, it isn't that they were inherently born with some magical capability. They worked very hard. They did what they call purposeful practice and they became better. And so when we start to look at and evaluate our, our things and say, oh, well, we should be doing better and I'm not doing good enough. And right, we have to accept that we can grow, right? And if we accept that we can grow, then we can go over time go, you know what? I may not be effective now, but over time I will become more effective. Right. And, you know, I think we all end up with goals that we set for ourselves at work. And, and, you know, if you think about your performance reviews and when you're giving reviews is you have goals in different areas. What's really important is that we don't get locked into a single goal. If there's one thing we're working for and it's not working, we're not going to feel effective. Right. And if there's one thing we're working for and we do it, well, then what? Right. Like, it's, you know, now what am I going to do? So you want to focus on the end result, not just the path, and you want to have different goals. Um, and as we look at that, we want to have different goals in different areas of our life so that when one's moving forward and another one's not, we're still making progress. So as you, you know, as you talk to people and you're encouraging people in your office, you know, it's not just about this one goal that you're going to set that you're either going to make or not, but how do you have multiple goals so that you can move forward and, and have success? Right. And so there is another exercise in the, the book that uh, you can get, and it is this, I, this identification of goals. And we do that because, you know, once you uh, identify the range of goals, you select some goals, you can identify barriers. And we, we want you to do this because 
most barriers have a prototypical or an archetypical solution. Everything that is a barrier has a solution. Now you're like, mm, I don't like the solution. Totally get that. But if you are short on money, you can get a second job. And you're like, I don't want to get a second job. Okay, fine. If you're short on time, you can quit your job. Well, then I won't have money, right? I totally get that you, you know, it's all choices, but there are ways to deal with really pretty much any barrier. Um, and, and to illustrate that, I don't, I don't know if anybody is a runner uh, in the audience, but the, there's this thing about the four minute mile. Um, and so let's take a step back in time and we're gonna go to about nine years before 1954 and people couldn't run a mile in less than four minutes. It had been done in slightly over four minutes, but there was, this, there was this thing that was happening where people thought that if I run a mile in less than four minutes, I'll keel over dead. It totally doesn't make any sense. You look at it in retrospect and you're like, 5,280 of some guy's foot, because that's what a foot is, against 240 seconds. And a second is an arbitrary measure of time. How do those intersect in such a way your that, heart that your heart explodes if you do this and listen, and it doesn't make any sense. And so for the nine years preceding May the 6th of 1954, no one could run a mile in less than four minutes. And that was the day that Roger Bannister finally broke the record. He finally crossed over that four minute mile. And guess what? totally didn't die. Totally didn't die. Right. And if I'm Bannister, right, nine years to get to the four mile, four minute mark, I'm like, woohoo, I am set. Right. Like I've got nine years on the speaking circuit. That's enough. And that's great. Until two months later, an Australian by the name of John Landy broke the record, broke, broke um, Bannister's record. Hmm. Within five years, two other runners had done it. Within 10 years, a high school student ran a mile in less than four minutes. Evolution. No, no, no. no evolution does not work that fast, right? Like evolution, like we did not become better runners and the high school student, right? And it wasn't Nike, right? Like, I don't care how great the equipment is. At some point, your legs have still got to put onto the ground. So what happened? What really happened was the belief changed. That, that barrier that it cannot be done became a, oh, it has been done. And it changed how it all worked. And so when we, when we start to look at our goals, we start to look at the barriers, a lot of people think, well, that barrier is impossible, right? Four minute mile can't be done because people will die. Okay, but is that real? Yeah. Or is that just the perception that we have? Yeah, and so as we talk about resolving barriers, um, and this is the Golden Gate Bridge, which resolved the barrier of having to drive all the way around to get to the other side. It's Marin County, yeah. Sure. 23 yeah. minute, 23 minute uh, ferry ride. Seems like this is a little faster, depending on traffic. Um, but I want to be really cognizant of, you know, what is your desires? What do you want to know? How do you want to change things in your organization? Because we're we're getting to that time where we can continue where we're at. Yep. Or we can move into, you know, what are things you can do in your offices to make a difference. Right. So up to you guys, we're here for you. Thoughts? Nicole, I'm gonna put it on you because you're gonna make the deciding factor here. Uh, we have a quiet group today. Um, I say continue with what uh, we're going to say about the bridge. Okay, great. Just wanna make sure, I, we want you guys to get exactly what you need out of this. Um. Yeah, so I, I mean, you know, the, the Golden Gate Bridge, um, is, it's a fascinating story. It took decades to do. And, and, and the net of it is, right, like it did. It took a 23-minute ferry ride into a, you know, three-minute uh, car ride, um, again, without traffic. Um, and so what are the ways that you feel like you're being held up? What are those barriers that are in your way that you can actually move and get out of the way? Um, So what's holding this elephant? What's keeping him from running away? Does anybody have an idea? It's 
some of the answers we've gotten are could be the food. Yeah. It could be the rope around his ankle. Um, there's part of a fence there. Maybe that's keeping him from going somewhere else. But what's really keeping him there? The thing that's keeping the, the thing that's keeping the elephant is the elephant believes that when there's something around his ankle, he will not be able to break free. And so he'll give a light tug on the rope and go, oh, there's a rope and I'm not supposed to go any further. What really is holding back the elephant is his perception that he can't go anywhere. And this is really learned helplessness. So Marty Seligman, 1968, published the first article that talked about learned helplessness. He had taken uh, dogs in a lab. And by the way, he said later that they were already using dogs in the lab. He wouldn't have done this if it was him, if it was his choice. Um, but they, they gave the, the dogs uh, in one group, a mild shock, but restrained them, prevented them from, from exiting. So it was uncomfortable, but not painful, right? And then in a, in a different group, there's no pre-training. And then he put each of these in a environment where there's a mild shock on one side, they could easily get over a barrier, like step over it, and they would be free of the shock. And what he found was the people, the, the dogs that had been trained, who had, had been restrained previously, wouldn't exit. And he called that learned helplessness. Now, if we, if we talk about this in, the ter in terms of humans and what we do for humans, it really is hopelessness, right? So what we would call helplessness in an animal, we typically call hopelessness, hopelessness in a human. And that's really dangerous. Um, hope is super important. It's, super, it's one of those things that we absolutely have to, to protect um, because it's hope that allows us to continue. Right. And when you're in burnout, when you're in the midst of burnout, you have this belief that it's never going to get any better, right. that it's never going to get better. It's never going to change, that nothing's ever going to be different than it is right now in this moment. Um, and holding on to the belief that whatever it is that's causing this pain, what's causing you to feel ineffective will change. It will get better. Um, that hope really is the gift that pushes away burnout. Right, right. You know, perseverance and grit drug the Grand Canyon. The, the Colorado River really um, made the Grand Canyon one speck of dirt at a time. And uh, so you can, whatever, whatever the situation is, given sufficient time and perseverance, you can get past it. I think, you know, it's important that as, as we close is when you're trying to change the culture, when you're trying to prevent burnout in your organization, is how do you support people and how do you help them to ex accept support? How do you how do you help them to really see their results? And it's not the, I mean, Rob has a great blessed menagerie um, of awards that, you know, in my mind, you know, it's like, eh, it's okay, you got a piece of acrylic because you did something for so many years. Right. It's nice. But how do you say, you know, you did this really well. You dealt with that patient so well and made them feel important. People want to be heard. People yeah. want to be understood. Um, and how we do that for one another really does change the culture. Yeah. Yeah, it does. So, Nicole, I don't know if you've got questions or if, if I assume people can come off mute. Um, love to, to answer any questions that folks might have about burnout, stress, the need for purpose, anything that, that might be on their minds. Sure, yeah, go ahead and unmute your line to ask the question or feel free to type it in the chat. I don't see any questions coming through, but um, as always, I found your presentation uh, very enjoyable. Um, I always seem to pick up something new. Um, so if anybody does have any questions that you think of later, certainly email us and we can connect you with Rob and Terry um, or help you ourselves. Um, I guess this uh, concludes our webinar for today. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for, Thanks for having us. Hope you have a wonderful afternoon. You as well. Bye-bye.